Hello and welcome to my channel. I am your loyal Hufflepuff, and today we will continue our reading in Shadow and Bone. If this is your first viewing of this channel, this is the first book in the trilogy Shadow and Bone, and there is a Netflix series also titled Sh Shadow and Bone, which is also based off of this book, as well as the first book of the duology titled Six of Crows. So we are going to be reading the next four chapters, and I'm looking forward to continue reading this with you guys. So let us get started. Tears of frustration welled up in my eyes. This is chapter four. Tears of frustration welled up in my eyes as Ivan dragged me out of the tent and into the late afternoon sun. He pulled me down a low hill to the road where the Darkling's black coach was already waiting. Surrounded by a ring of mounted Grisha Ithralki and flanked by lines of armed calv calvary, cal cavalry, <clears throat> two of the Darkling's gray clad guards waited by the door to the coach with a woman and a fair haired man, both of whom wore Corporal Key read. Get in, commanded Ivan. Then, seeming to remember the Darkling's order, he added, If you please. No, I said. What? Ivan seemed genuinely surprised. The other Corporal Key looked shocked. No, I repeated. I'm not going anywhere. There's been some kind of mistake. I, Ivan, cut me off, taking a firmer grip on my arm. The Darkling doesn't make mistakes. He said through gritted teeth, Get in the coach. I don't want... Ivan lowered his head until his nose was just inches from mine and practically spat. Do you think I care what you want? In a few hours' time, every Fajit Ferdan spy and Shuhan assassin will know what happened on the fold, and they'll be coming for you. Our only chance is to get you to Oz Alta and behind the palace walls before anyone else realizes what you are. Now get in the coach. He shoved me through the door and followed me inside, throwing himself down on the seat opposite me in disgust. The other Corporal Key joined him, followed by Oprichniki guards, who settled on either side of me. So I'm the Darkling's prisoner? You're under his protection. What's the difference? Ivan's, Ivan's expression was unreadable. Pray you never find out. I scowl, scowled, I scowled and slumped back in on the cushioned seat, then hissed in pain. I'd forgotten my wounds. See to her, Ivan said to the female Corporal, Corporal Nick. Her cuffs were embroidered in healer's gray. The woman switched places with me on the Oprichniki so that she could sit beside me. A soldier ducked his head inside the door. We're ready, he said. Good, Ivan repli replied Ivan. Stay alert and keep moving. We'll only stop in to change horses. If we stop before then, you'll know something is wrong. The soldier disappeared, closing the door behind him. The driver didn't hesitate. With a cry and the snap of a whip, the coach lurched forward. I felt an icy tumble of panic. What was happening to me? I thought about just throwing open the coach door and making a run for it. But where would I run? We were surrounded by armed men in the middle of a military camp. And, if, and even if we weren't, where could I possibly go? Please remove your coat, said the woman beside me. What? I need to see your wounds. I considered refusing... But what was the point? I shrugged awkwardly out of my coat and let the healer ease my shirt over my shoulders. The corporal key were the order of the living and the dead. I tried to focus on the living part, but I'd never been healed by Grisha and every muscle in my body tensed with fear. She took something out of a little satch satchel and a sharp chemical scent filled the coach. I flinched as she cleaned the wounds, my fingers digging into my knees. When she was done, I felt a hot, prickling sensation between my shoulders, a bit down hard, on, hard on, on my lip. The urge to scratch my back was almost unbearable. 
Finally, she stopped and pulled my shirt back into place. I flexed my shoulders carefully. The pain was gone. Now the arm, she said. I'd almost forgotten the cut from the Darkling's knife, but my wrist and hand were sticky with blood. She wiped the cut clean and then held up, held my arm up into the light. Try to stay still, she said, or there will be a scar. I did my best, but the jostling of the coach made it, dif made it difficult. The healer passed my hand, slow hand slowly over the wound. I felt my skin throb with heat. My arm began to itch furiously, and as I watched in amazement, my flesh seemed to shimmer and move as the two sides of the cut knit together and the skin sealed shut. The itching stopped and the healer was set back. I reached out and touched my arm. There was a slightly raised scar where the cut had been, but what? But that was all. Thank you, I said in awe. The healer nodded. Give her your kifta, Ivan said to her. The woman frowned but hesitated only a moment before she shrugged out of her red kifta and handed it to me. Why do I need this? I asked. Just take it, Ivan growled. I took the kifta from the healer. She kept her face blank, but I could tell it pained her to part, to part with it. Before I could decide whether or not to offer her my blood-stained coat, Ivan tapped the roof and the coach began to slow. The healer didn't even wait for it to stop moving before she opened the door and swung outside. Ivan pulled the, do pulled the door shut. The Oprichnik slipped back into the seat beside me, and we were on our way once more. Where is she going? I asked. Back to Krebersk, replied Ivan. We'll travel faster with less weight. You look heavier than she does, I muttered. Put on the kefta, he said. Why? Because it's made with material, material key core cloth. It can withstand rifle fire. I stared at him. Was that even possible? There were stories of Grisha withstanding direct gunshots and surviving what should have been fatal wounds. I had never taken them seriously, but maybe fab fabricator hand handiwork was the truth behind those peasants' tales. Do you all wear this stuff? I asked as I pulled on the kefta. When we were in the field, said the opchnik. I nearly jumped. I was. It was the first time either of the guards had spoken. Just don't get shot in the head, Ivan added with a condescending grin. Condescending grin. I ignored him. The kefta was far too large. It felt soft and unfamiliar. The fur lining warm against my skin. I chewed my lip. It didn't seem fair that Oprichniki and Grisha wore core cloth while ordinary soldiers went without. Did our officers wear it too? The coach picked up speed. In the time it had taken for the healer to do her work, dusk had begun to fall and we had left Gribersk behind. I leaned forward, straining to see out the window, but the world outside was a twilight blur. I felt th tears threatening again and blinked them back. A few hours ago, I'd been a frightened girl on my way into the unknown, but at least I'd known who and what I was. With a pang, I thought of the document's tent. The other su surveyors might be at their work right now. Would they be mourning Alexei? Would they be talking about me and what happened on the fold? I clutched the crumpled army issue coat. I had bundled up on my I had bundled <clears throat> up on my lap. Surely this all had to be a dream, some crazy hallucination brought on by the terrors of the shadow fold. I couldn't really be wearing a Grisha's kefta sitting in the Darklands coach, the same coach that had almost crushed me only yesterday. Someone lit a lamp inside the coach. And in the flickering light I could better I could better see the silken interior. The seats were heavily cushioned black velvet. On the windows, the darkling symbol had been cut into the glass. Two overlapping circles, the sun in eclipse. Across from me, the two Grish Grisha were studying me with open curiosity. Their red kefta were the f of the finest wool, embroidered lavishly in black and lined in black fur. 
the fair-haired heart render was lanky, lanky, and had a long, melancholy face. Ivan was taller, broader, with wavy brown hair and sun-bronzed skin. Now that I bothered to look, I had to admit he was handsome, and and knows it too, a big, handsome bully. I shifted re restlessly in my seat, uncomfortable with their stares. I looked out the window, but there was nothing to see except the growing darkness and my own pale reflection. I looked back at the Grisha and tried to, to quash my irritation. They were still gawking at me. I reminded myself that these men could make my heart explode in my chest, but it, eventually I just couldn't stand it. I don't do tricks, you know, I snapped. The Grisha exchanged a glance. That was a pretty good trick back in the tent, Ivan said. I rolled my eyes. Well, if I plan on doing anything exciting, I promise to give fair warning, so just take a nap or something. Ivan looked affronted. I felt a sharp a little snap of fear, but the fair-haired Nick let out a bark of laughter. I am fe... Fedior, he said, and this is Ivan. I know, I replied, then picturing Anna Kuya's dis disapproving glare, I added, very pleased to meet you. They exchanged an amused glance. I ignored them and wriggled back in my seat, trying to get comfortable. It wasn't easy with two heavily armed, so armed soldiers taking up most of the room. The coach hit a bump and jolted forward. Is it safe? I asked. To be traveling at night? No, Fedor said, but it would be considerably more dangerous to stop. Because people are after me now? Because people are after me now? I said sarcastically. If not now, then soon. I snorted. Fedor raised his eyebrows and said, For hundreds of years, the Shadowfold has been doing our enemies work, closing off our ports, choking us, making, making us weak. If you're truly a sun summoner, then your power could be the key to opening up the fold, or maybe even destroying it. Ferida and the Shuhan won't just stand by and let that happen. I gaped at him. What did these people expect from me? And what would they do to me when they realized I couldn't deliver? This is ridiculous, I muttered. Fedior looked, up, looked me up and down and then smiled slightly. Maybe, he said. I frowned. He was agreeing with me, but I still felt insulted. How did you hide it? Ivan asked abruptly. What? Your power, Ivan said impatiently. How did you hide it? I didn't hide it. I didn't know it, it was there. That's impossible. And yet here we are, I said bitterly. Weren't you tested? A dim memory flashed through my, my mind. Three cloaked figures in the sitting room at... Karamzin, a, womanly, a woman's haughty brow. Of course I was tested. When? When I was eight. That's very late, commented Ivan. Why didn't your parents have you tested earlier? Because they were dead, I thought, but didn't, but didn't say. And no one paid much attention to Duke Karamzov's orphans, I shrugged. It doesn't make any sense, Ivan grumbled. That's what I've been trying to tell you. I leaned forward, looking desperately from Ivan to Fedor. I'm not what you think I am. I'm not Grisha. What happened in the fold? I don't know what happened. But I didn't do it. And what happened in the Grisha tent? Asked Fedor calmly. I can't explain that. But it wasn't my doing. The Darkling did something when he touched me. Ivan laughed. He didn't do anything. He's an amplifier. A what? Fadier and Ivan exchanged another glance. Forget it, I snapped. I don't care. Ivan reached inside his collar and removed something on a thin silver chain. He held it out for me to examine. My curiosity got the best of me, and I edged forward to get a better view. It looked like a cluster of sharp black claws. What are they? My amplifier, Ivan said with pride. The claws from the forepaw of a sure-born bear. It, I killed it myself when I left, left, left school and joined the Darkling's service. 
he leaned back in his seat and tucked the chain into the, his collar. An amplifier increases Agrisha's power, said Fedor, but the power must be there to begin with. Do all Grisha have them? I asked. Fedor stiffened. No, he said. Amplifiers are rare and hard to obtain. Only the Darkling's most favored Grisha have them, Ivan said smudgily. I was sorry I had asked. The Darkling is a living amplifier, Fedor said. That's what you felt. Like the claws? That's his power? One of his powers, corrected Ivan. He pulled the kefta tighter around me. Feeling suddenly cold, I remembered the surety that had flooded through me with the Darkling's touch, and that strangely familiar sensation of calling, of a call echoing through me, a call that demanded, demanded an answer. It had been frightening, but exhilarating too. In that moment, all my doubt and fear had been replaced by a kind of absolute certainty. I was no... I was no one, a refugee from an unnamed village, a scrawny, clumsy girl hurt hurtling alone through the gathering dark. But when the Darkling had closed his fingers around my wrist, I felt different, like something more. I shut my eyes and tried to focus, tried to remember that feeling of certainty, to bring that sure and perfect power into blazing life. But nothing happened. I sighed and opened my eyes. Ivan looked highly amused. The urge to kick him was almost overwhelming. You're all in for a big disappointment, I muttered. For your sake, I hope you're wrong, said Ivan. For all our sakes, said Fedor. I lost track of time. Night and day passed through the windows of the coach. I spent most of my time staring out at the landscape, searching for landmarks to give me some sense of of the familiar. I'd expected that we would take side side roads instead of we instead but instead we stuck to the V. And Fadier explained that the Darkling had opted for speed over stealth. He was hoping to get me safe uh, behind Os Alta's double walls before rumor of my power spread to the enemy spies and assassins who operated operated within Ravka's borders. We kept a brutal pace. Occasionally, we stopped to change horses, and I was allowed to stretch my legs. When I was able to sleep, my dreams were plagued by monsters. Once I woke with a start, my heart pounding to find Fadir watching me. Ivan was asleep beside me, snoring loudly. Who's Maul? he asked. I realized I must have been talking in my sleep. Embarrassed, I glanced at the Opruchniki guards flanking me. One stared impassively forward. The other was dozing. Outside, the afternoon sun shone through a grove of birchwood tr trees as we rumbled past. No one, I said. A friend. A the tracker? I nodded. He was with me on the shadowfold. He saved my life. And you saved his. I opened my mouth to disagree, but stopped. Had I saved Maul's life? The thought brought me up short. It's a great honor, said Fadir, to save a life. You saved many. Not, en not enough, I murmured, thinking of the terrified look on Alexei's face as he was pulled into the darkness. If I had this power, why hadn't I been able to save him, or any of his other of the others who had perished in on the fold? I looked at Fadir. If you really believe that saving a life is an honor, then why not become a healer instead of a heart render? Fadir considered the passing scenery. Of all Grisha, Korporalki have the hardest road. We require the most training and the most study. At the end of it, at the end of it all, I felt I could save more lives as a heart render. As a killer, I asked in surprise. As a soldier, Fadir corrected. He shrugged. To kill or to cure. He said with a smile, with a sad smile, we each have our own gifts. Abruptly, his expression changed. He sat up straight and jabbed Ivan in the side. Wake up. The coach had stopped. I looked around in confusion. Are we? I began, but the guard beside me clapped a hand over my mouth and put a finger to his lips. The coach door flew open and a soldier tucked his head in. 
There's a fallen tree across the road, he said, but it could be a trap. Be alert, and... He never finished his sentence. A shot rang out, and he fell forward, a bullet in his back. Suddenly, the air was full of panicked cries and the te teeth-rattling sound of rifle fire as a volley of bullets struck the coach. Get down, yelled the guard beside me, shielding my body with his own as Ivan kicked the dead soldier out of the way and pulled the door closed. Ferdans, said the guard, peering outside. Ivan turned to Fedor, Fedor and the guard beside me. Fedor, go with him. You take this side. We'll take the other. At all costs, defend the coach. Fedor pulled a large knife from his belt and handed it to me. Stay close to the floor and stay quiet. The Grisha waited with the guards, crouching by the windows. The, then a, at a signal from Ivan, they leapt from either side of the coach, slamming the doors behind them. I huddled on the floor, clutching the knife's heavy hilt, my knees to my chest, my back pressed against the base of the seat. Outside, I could hear the sounds of fighting, metal on metal, grunts and shouts, horses waning. The coach shook as a body slammed against the glass of the window. I saw with horror that it was one of my guards. His body left a red smear against the glass as he slid from view. The coach door flew open and a man with a wild, yellow-bearded face appeared. I scrambled to the other side of the coach. The knife held out before me. He barked something to his compa compatriots in his strange Ferdin tongue and reached f uh, for my leg. As I kicked out at him, the door behind me opened and I nearly tumbled into another bearded man. He grabbed me under the arms, pulling me roughly from the coach as I howled and slashed out with the knife. I must have made contact because he cursed and loosened his grip on me. I struggled to my feet and ran. We were in a wooded glen where the vine narrowed to pass between two sloping hills. All around me, soldiers and Grisha were fighting with bearded men. Trees burst into flames, caught in the line of Grisha fire. I saw Fedor throw his hand out and the man before him crumpled to the ground, clutching his chest, blood trickling from his, from his mouth. I ran without this direction, clambering up the nearest hill, my feet slipping on the fallen leaves that covered the forest floor, my breath coming in gasps. I made it halfway up the slope before I was tackled from behind. I fell forward, the knife flying from my hands as I put my arms out to break my fall. I twisted and kicked as the yellow-bearded man grabbed hold of my legs. I looked desperately down to the glen, but the soldiers and Grisha below me were fighting for their lives. Clearly outnumbered and unable to come to my aid, I struggled and thrashed, but the Fedan, Fedan <clears throat> was too strong. He climbed on top of me, using his knees to pin my arms to my sides and reached for his knife. I'll gut you right here, witch, he snarled in a heavy Ferdan accent. At that moment, I heard the pounding of hooves and my attacker turned his head to look down at the road. A group of riders roared into the glen, their kefta streaming red and blue, their hands blazing fire and thunder. The lead rider was dressed in black. The darkling slid from his mount and threw his hands wide then brought them together with a resounding boom. Skeins of darkness shot from his clasped hands, snaking through the glen, finding the Ferdan assassins, then slithering up their bodies to swathe their faces in seething shadow. They screamed. Some dropped their swords. Others waved, the, waved them blindly. I watched in mingled awe and horror as the rough gone fighting fighters seized the advantage, cutting down the blinded, helpless men with ease. The bearded man on top of me muttered something I did not understand. I thought it might be a prayer. He was staring, frozen at the darkling, his terror pal palpable. I took my chance. I'm here, I called down the hillside. <clears throat> the darkling's head turned. He raised his hands. Nej, bleated the Ferdan, his knife held high. 
I don't need to see to put my knife through her heart. I held my breath. Silence felt in the glen, broken only by the moans of dying men. The darkling dropped his hands. You must realize that you are surrounded, he said calmly, his voice carrying through the trees. The assassin's gaze darted right and left, then up to the crest of the hill where rough gun soldiers were emerging, rifles at the ready. As the Ferdan looked around frantically, the darkling edged a few steps up the slope. No closer, the man shrieked. The darkling stopped. Give her to me, he said, and I'll let you scurry back to your king. The assassin gave a crazed little giggle. Oh no, oh no, I don't think so, he said, shaking his head. His knife held high above my pounding heart, its cruel point gleaming in the sun. The darkling doesn't spare lives. He looked down at me. He, his lashes were light blood, blonde, almost invisible. He will not have you, he crooned softly. He will not have the witch. He will not have this power, too. He raised the knife higher and yelled, Skurden Ferda. The knife plunged down in a shining arc. I turned my head, squeezing my eyes shut in terror. And as I did, I glimpsed the darkling. I glimpsed the darkling, his arms slashing through the air in front of him, of him. I heard another crack like thunder, and then nothing. Slowly, I opened my eyes and took in the horror before me. I opened my mouth to scream, but no sound would come. The man on top of me had been cut in two. His head, his right shoulder, and his arm on, lay on the forest floor. His white hand still clasping the knife. The rest of him swayed for a moment above me. A dark wisp of smoke fading in the air beside the wound that ran the length of his severed torso. Then what remained of him fell forward. I found my voice and screamed. I crawled backwards, scrambling away from the mutilated body, unable to get to my feet, unable to look away from the awful sight, my body shaking uncontrollably. The darkling hurried up the hill and knelt beside me, blocking my view of the corpse. Look at me, I instructed. I tried to focus on his face but all I could see was the assassin's severed body, his blood pooling in the damp leaves. What, what did you do to him? I asked, my voice quavering. What I had to do, can you stand? I nodded shakily. He took my hands and helped me to my feet. When my gaze slid back to the corpse, he took hold of my chin and drew my eyes back to his. At me, he commanded. I nodded and tried to keep my eyes trained on the darkling as he led me down the hill and called out orders to his men. Clear the road. I need twenty riders. The girl, Ivan asked, rides with me, said the darkling. He left me by his horse as he went to confer with Ivan and his captains. I was relieved to see Fidir with them, clutching his arm but looking otherwise uninjured. I petted the horse's sweaty flank and breathed in the clean leather smell of the saddle, trying to slow the beating of my heart and to ignore what I knew lay behind me on the, the hillside. A few minutes later, I saw soldiers and Grisha mounting their horses. Several men had finished clearing the tree from the road and others were riding out with the much battered coach. A decoy, said the darkling, coming up beside me. We'll take the southern trails. It's what we should have done in the first place. So you do make mistakes, I said without thinking. He paused in the act of pulling on his gloves, and I pressed my lips together nervously. I didn't mean, of course I make mistakes, he said. His mouth curved into a half smile. Just not often. He raised his hood and offered me his hand to help me onto the horse. For a moment, I hesitated. He stood before me, a dark rider, cloaked in black, his features in shadow. The image of the severed man loomed up in my mind, and my stomach, alert, stomach turned. As if he'd read my thoughts, he repeated, 
I did what I had to, Alina. I knew that. He had saved my life. And what other choice did I have? I put my hand in his and let the Darkling help me into the saddle. He slid up behind me and kicked the horse into a trot. As we left the glen, he felt the reality of what had just happened sink into me. You're shaking, he said. I'm not used to people trying to kill me. Really? I hardly noticed anymore. I turned to look at him. That trace of a smile was still there, but I wasn't entirely sure he was kidding. I turned back around and said, and I did just see a man get sliced in half. I kept my voice light, but I couldn't hide the fact that I was still trembling. The Darkling switched his reins to one hand and pulled off one of his gloves. I stiffened as I felt him slide his bare palm under my hair and rest it on the nape of my neck. My surprise gave way to calm as that same sense of power and surety flooded through me. With one hand cupping my head, he kicked the horse into a canter. I closed my eyes and tried not to think, and soon, despite the movement of the horse, despite the terrors of the day, I fell into a troubled sleep. Chapter 5 The next few days passed in a, in a blur of discomfort and exhaustion. We stayed off the Vi and kept to side roads and narrow hunting trails, moving as quickly as the hilly and sometimes treacherous terrain would allow. I lost all sense of where we were and how far we had gone. After the first day, the Darkling and I, and I had ridden separately, but I found that I was always aware of where he was in the column of riders. I didn't say a word he didn't he didn't he didn't he didn't say a word to me. And as the hours and days wore on, I st started to worry that I had that I'd somehow offended him. Though given how little we'd spoken, I wasn't sure how I could have managed it. Occasionally I caught him looking at me his eyes cool and unreadable. unreadable. I'd never been a, a particularly good writer, and the pace the Darkling set was taking its toll. No matter which way I shifted in my saddle, some part of my body ached. I stared listlessly at my horse's twitching ears and tried not to think of my burning legs or the throbbing in my lower back. On the fifth night, when we stopped to make camp at an, at an abandoned farm, I wanted to leap from my horse in joy, but I was so stiff I settled before sliding awkwardly to the ground. I thanked the soldier who saw to my, my, my mount and waddled slowly down a small hill to where I could hear the soft gurgle of a stream. I knelt by the bank on shaggy legs and washed my face and hands in the cold water. The air had changed over the last couple of days, and the bright blue skies of autumn were giving way to sullen gray. The soldiers seemed to think that we would reach Oz Alta before any real weather came on. And then what? What would happen to me when we reached the little palace? What would happen when I couldn't do what they wanted me to do? It wasn't wise to disappoint kings or darklings, I doubted they'd just send me back to the regiment with a pat on my back. I wondered if Maul was still in Krib Kribrsk. If his wounds had healed, he might already have been sent back across the fold or onto some other assignment. I thought of his face disappearing into the crowd in the Grisha's tent. I hadn't even had a chance to say goodbye. In the gathering dusk, I stretched my arm and my arm, I stretched my arms and back and tried to shake the feeling of gloom that had settled over. Settled over me. It's probably for the best, I told myself. How would I have said goodbye to Maul anyway? Thanks for being my best friend and making my life bearable. Oh, and sorry I fell in love with you for a while there. Make sure to write. What are you smiling at? I whirled, peering into the gloom, 
The Darkling's voice seemed to float out of the shadows. He walked down to the stream, crouching on the bank to splash water on his face and through his dark hair. Well, he asked, looking up, up at me. Myself, I admitted. Are you that funny? I'm hilarious. The Darkling regarded me in what remained of the twilight. I had the disquieting sensation that I was being studied. Other than a bit of dust on his kefta, our trek seemed to have taken little toll on him. My skin prickled with embarrassment as I became keenly aware of my torn, too large kefta, my dirty hair, and the bruise of the Ferdan assassin had left on my cheek. Was he looking at me and regretting his decision to drag me all this way? Was he thinking that he'd made another of his infrequent mistakes? I'm not Grisha, I blurted. The evidence suggests otherwise, he said with little concern. What makes you so certain? Look at me. I'm looking. Do you, do I look like a Grisha to you? Grisha, Grisha were beautiful. They didn't have spotty skin and dull brown hair and scrawny arms. He shook his head and rose. You don't understand at all he said, and began walking back up the hill. Are you going to explain it to me? Not right now, no. I was so furious, I wanted to smack him on the back of his head, and if I hadn't seen him cut a man in half, I might have just, I might have done just that. I settled for glaring at the space between his shoulders, shoulder blades, as I followed him up the hill. Inside the farm's broken down barn, the Darkling's men had cleared a space on the earthen floor and built a fire. One of them had caught it and killed a gross, grouse and was roasting it over the flames. It had made a, pool, a poor meal sh shared among all, all of us, but the Darkling did not want to send his men ra ranging into the woods for game. I took a place by the fire and ate my small portion in silence. When I'd finished, I hesitated for only a moment before wiping my fingers on my already filthy kefta. It was probably the nicest thing I'd ever worn or would wear, and something about seeing the fabric stained and torn and torn made me feel particu particularly low. In the light of, from the fire, I watched the Opchniki sitting side by side with the Grisha. Some of them had already drifted away from the fire to bed down for the night. Others had been posted to the wa first watch. The rest sat talking as the flames ebbed, passing a flask back and forth. The dark lane sat with them. I'd noticed that he had taken no more than his share of the grouse, and now he sat beside his, sol beside his soldiers on the cold ground, a man second in power only to the king. He must have felt my gaze, because he turned to look at me, his granite eyes glimmering in the firelight. I flushed. To my dismay, he rose and came to sit beside me, offering me the flask. I hesitated and then took a sip, grimacing at the taste. I'd never liked kvass, but the teachers of Kramzin had drunk it like water. Maul and I had stolen a bottle once. The beating we'd taken were when we were caught had been nothing compared to how miserably sick we'd been. Still, it, it burned going down, and the warmth was welcome. I took another sip and handed the flask back to him. Thank you, I said with a little cough. He drank, staring into the fire, and then said, All right ask me. I blinked at him, taken aback. I wasn't sure where to begin. My tired mind had been brimming with questions, worrying in a taste state between panic and exhaustion and disbelief since we left Kribersk. I wasn't sure that I had the energy to form a thought, and when I opened my mouth, the question that came out surprised me. How old are you? He glanced at me, bemused. I don't know exactly. How can you not know? The Darkling shrugged. How old are you exactly? I flashed him a sour look. 
I didn't know the date of my birth. All the orphans at Karamzin were given the Duke's birthday in honor of our benefactor. Well, then, roughly, how old are you? Why do you want to know? Because I've heard stories about you since I was a child. But you don't look much older than I am, I said honestly. What kind of stories? The usual kind, I said with some annoyance. If you don't want to, s to answer me, just say so. I don't want to answer you. Oh. Then he, sa he sighed and said, 120, give or take. What? I squeaked. The soldier sitting across from me glanced over. That's impossible, I said more quietly. He looked into the flames. When a fire burns, it uses up the wood. It devours it, leaving only ash. Grisha power doesn't work that way. How does it work? Using our power makes us stronger. It feeds us instead of consuming us. Most Grisha live long lives, but not 120 years. But not 120 years. No, he admitted. The length of a Grisha's life is proportional to his or her power. The greater the power, the longer the life. And when the power is amplified, he trailed off with a shrug. And you're a living amplifier, like Ivan's bear. The hint of a smile tugged at the corner of his mouth, like Ivan's bear. An unpleasant thought occurred to me, but that means that my bones or a few of my teeth would make another Grisha very powerful. Well, that's completely creepy. Doesn't that worry you a little bit? No, he said simply. Now you answer my question. What kind of stories were you told about me? I shifted uncomfortably. Well, our teachers told us that you strength strengthened the second army by gathering Grisha from outside of Ravka. I didn't have to gather them. They came to me. Other countries don't treat their Grisha so well as Ravka, he said grimly. The Ferdans burn, burn us as witches, and the Kirch sell us as slaves, and the Shuhan carve us up seeking the source of our power. What else? They said you were the strongest darkling in generations. I didn't ask for you for flattery. I fingered a loose thread of on the cuff of my kepta. He watched me, waiting. Well, I said, there was an old scarf who worked, serf who worked on the estate. Go on, he said, tell me. He, he said that darklings were, are born without souls, that only s something truly evil could have created the shadow fold. I glanced at his cold face and added hastily, but Anakuya sent him hacking and told us it was all peasant superstition. The Darkling sighed. I doubt that Surf is the only one who believes that. I said nothing. Not everyone thought like Eva or the old Surf, but I'd been in the first army long enough to know that most ordinary soldiers didn't trust Grisha and felt no allegiance to the Darkling. After a moment, the Darkling said, my great-great-great-grandfather was the black heretic, Darkling, who created the Shadowfold. It was a mistake, an experiment born of his greed. Maybe his evil, I don't know. But every Darkling since then has tried to undo the damage he did to our country, and I am and I'm no different. He turned to me then, his expression serious, the firelight playing over the perfect planes of his features. I've spent my life searching for a way to make things right. You're the first glimmer of hope I've had in a long time. Me? The world is changing, Alina. Muskets and rifles are just the beginning. I've seen the weapons they're developing. In Kirch and Ferda, the age of Grisha power is coming to an end. It was a terrifying thought, but... But what about the First Army? They have rifles. They have weapons. Where do you think their rifles come from? Their ammunition. Every time we cross the fold, we lose lives. A divided Ravka won't survive the new age. We need our ports. We need our harbors. 
and only you can give them back to us. How? I pleaded. How am I supposed to do that? By helping me destroy the shadow fold. I shook my head. You're crazy. This is all crazy. I looked up through the broken beams of the barn's roof to the night sky. It was full of stars, but I could only see the endless reaches of darkness between them. I imagined myself standing in the dead silence of the shadow fold, blind, frightened, with nothing to protect me but my supposed power. I thought of the black heretic. He had created the fold, a darkling just like the one who sat watching me so closely in the firelight. What about that thing you did? I asked before I could lose my nerve. To the Firdan. He looked back into the fire. It's called the cut. It requires great power and a great focus. It's something few Grisha can do. I rubbed my arms, trying to starve off, to stave off the chill that had taken hold of me. He glanced at me and then back up to the fire. If I had cut him down with a sword, would that make it any better? Would it? I had been countless, I had seen countless horrors in the last few days, but even after the nightmares of the fold, the image that stayed with me, that reared up in my dreams and chased me into walking, was of the bearded man's severed body, swaying in the dappled sunlight before it toppled onto me. I don't know, I said quietly. Something flashed across his face, something that looked like anger or maybe even pain. Without another word, he rose and walked away from me. I watched him disappear into the darkness and felt suddenly guilty. Don't be a fool, I chastised myself. He's the Darkling. He's the second most powerful man in Rafka. He's 120 years old. You didn't hurt his feelings. But I thought of the look that had flickered over his features. The shame in his voice when he'd talked about the black heretic. And I couldn't shake the feeling that I had failed some kind of test. Two days later, just after dawn, we passed through a massive gate and the famous double walls of Oz Alta. Maul and I had taken our training not far from here, in the military stronghold of Poliznaya, but we had never been inside the city itself. Oz Alta was reserved for the very wealthy, for the homes of military and government officials, their families, their mistresses, and all the businesses that c cater to them. I felt a twinge of disappointment as we passed shuttered shops, a wide marketplace where a few vendors were already setting up their stalls, and crowded rows of narrow houses. Of Oz Alta was called the Dream City. It was the capital of Rafka, home to the Grisha and the King's Grand Palace. But if anything, it just looked like a bigger, dirtier version of the market town at Kremzin. All that changed when we reached the bridge. It spanned a wide canal where little boats bobbed in the water beneath it. And on the other side, rising from the mist, white and white and gleaming, lay the other Oz Alta. As we crossed the bridge, I saw that it could be raised to turn the canal into a giant moat that would separate the stream city before us from the common mess of the market town that lay behind. When we reached the other side of the canal, it was as if we had passed into another world. Everywhere I looked, I saw fountains and plazas, verdant parks and broad boulevards lined with perfect rows of trees. Here and there I saw lights in the lower stories of the grand houses where kitchen fires were being lit and the day's work was, start was starting. The streets began to slope upward and as we climbed higher the houses became larger and more imposing until finally we arrived at another wall and another set of gates. These wrought in gleaming gold and emblazoned with the king's double eagle. Along the wall, I could see heavily armed men at their posts, a grim reminder that for all its beauty, Oz Alta was still the capital of a country that had long been at war. The gates swung open 
We rode up a broad path paved in glittering gravel and bordered by rows of elegant trees. To the left and right, stretching into the distance, I saw manicured gardens, rich with green and hazy in the midst of early morning. Above it, above it all, atop a series of marble terraces and golden fountains, limbed the grand palace, the Rothgun's king's winter home. When we finally reached the huge double eagle fountain at its base, the darkling brought his horse up beside mine. So what do you think of it? he asked. I glanced at him, then back at the elaborate facade. It was larger than any building I had ever seen. Its terraces crowded with statues. Its three stories gleaming with row after row of shining windows, each ornamented extensively in what I suspected was real gold. It's very grand, I said carefully. He looked at me, a little smile playing on his lips. I think it's the ugliest building I've ever seen, he said, and nudged his horse forward. He, we followed a path that curved behind the palace and deeper into the grounds, passing a hedge maze, a rolling lawn with a columned, columned temple at its center, and a vast greenhouse, its, its windows clouded with con condensation. Then we entered a thick stand of trees, large enough that it felt like a small wood, and passed through a long, dark corridor where the branches made a dense, braided roof above us. The hair rose on my arms. I had the same feeling that I'd had as we were crossing the canal. That sense of crossing the boundary between two worlds. When we emerged from the tunnel into weak sunshine, I looked down a gentle slope and saw a building like nothing I'd ever seen. Welcome to the little palace, said the Darkling. It was a strange name because though it was smaller than the Grand Palace, the Little Palace was still huge. It rose from the trees surrounding it like something carved from an enchanted forest, a cluster of dark wood walls and golden domes. As we drew closer, I saw that every inch of it was covered in intricate carvings of birds and flowers, twisting vines and magical beasts. A charcoal-clad group of servants waited on the steps. I dismounted, and one of them rushed forward to take my horse, while others pushed open a large set of double doors. As we passed through them, I couldn't resist the urge to reach out and touch the exquisite carvings. They had been inlaid with mother of pearl so that they sparkled in the early morning light. How many hands! How many years had it taken to create such a place? We passed through the, an entry chamber and then into a vast hexagonal room with four long tables arranged in a square at its center. Our footsteps echoed off the stone floor and a massive gold dome seemed to float above us at an impossible height. The Darkling took aside one of his, the servants, an older woman in a charcoal dress and spoke to her in hushed tones. Then he gave me a small bow and strode off across the hall, followed by his men. I felt a surge of annoyance. The Darkling had, had said little to me since that, that night in the barn, and he'd given me no idea that I might expect once, no idea what I might expect once we arrived. But I didn't have the nerve or the energy to run after him. So I meekly followed the woman in gray through another pair of double doors and into one of the smaller towers. When I saw the, all the stairs, I almost broke down and wept. Maybe I'll just ask if I can stay down here in the middle of the hall, I thought miserably. Instead, I put my hand on the carved banister and dragged myself upward my stiff body protesting every step. When we reached the top, I felt like celebrating and lying down and taking a nap, but the servant was already moving down in the halfway. 
We passed door after door until finally we reached a chamber where another uniformed maid stood waiting by an open doorway. Dimly, I registered a large room, heavy golden curtains, a fire burning in a beautifully tiled grate, but all I really cared about was the huge canopied bed. Can I get you anything, something to eat? Asks the woman. I shook my head. I just wanted sleep. Very good, she said, and nodded to the maid, who courtesied, curtsied and disappeared down the hall. Then I'll let you rest. Make sure you lock to lock your door. I blinked. As a precaution, said the woman and left, closing the door gently behind her. A precaution against what, I wondered, but I was too tired to think about it. I locked the door, peeled off the kefta and my boots, and fell into bed. Chapter 6 I dreamed that I was in, I was back in Karamzin, slipping through the darkened hallways in stockinged feet, trying to find them all. I could hear him calling to me, but his voice never seemed to get any closer. Finally, I reached the top floor and the door to the old blue bedroom where we liked to sit in the window seat and looked out at, at, our, at our meadow. I heard Maul laughing. I threw open the door and screamed. There was blood everywhere. The Volcra was perched on the window seat and as it turned to me on me, and opened its horrible jaws. I saw that it had gray quartz eyes. I bolted awake, my heart thudding in my chest, and looked around in terror. For a moment, I couldn't remember where I was. Then I groaned and flopped back onto the pillows. I had just started to doze off again when someone began pounding on the door. Go away, I mumbled from beneath the covers. But the pounding only grew louder. I sat up, feeling my whole body shriek in rebellion. My head ached, and then I tried to stand. My legs did not want to cooperate. All right, I shouted. I'm coming. The knocking stopped. I stumbled over to the door and reached for the block. But then I hesitated. Who is it? I don't have time for this, a female voice snapped from behind the door. Open now. I shrugged. Let them kill me or kidnap me or whatever they wanted. As long as I didn't have to ride a horse or climb stairs, I wouldn't complain. I had barely unlocked the door when it flew open and a tall girl pushed past me, surveying the room and then me with a critical eye. She was easily the most beautiful person I'd ever seen. Her wavy hair was deepest auburn, auburn. her irises large and golden. Her skin was so smooth and flawless that she looked as if her perfect cheekbones had been carved from marble. She wore a cream-colored kefta, embroidered in gold and lined in reddish fox fur. All saints, she said, looking, over, looking me over. Have you even bathed? And what happened to your face? I flushed bright red my hand flying to the bruise on my cheek. It had been nearly a week since I'd left camp and longer since I'd bathed or brushed my hair. I was covered in dirt and blood and smelled of horses and the smell of horses. I, but the girl was already shouting orders to the servants who had followed her, followed her into the room. Draw a bath, a hot one. I'll need my kit and get her out of those clothes. The servants descended upon me, pulling out, pulling at my buttons. Hey, I shouted, batting their hands away. The Grisha rolled her eyes. Hold her down if you have to. The servants redoubled their efforts. Stop, I shouted, backing away from them. They hesitated, looking from me to the girl. Honestly, nothing sounded better than a hot bath and a change of clothes. But I wasn't about to let some tyrannical redhead push me up, push me around. What is going on? Who are you? I don't have to make time, I snapped. I've covered almost 200 miles on horseback. I haven't had a good night's sleep in a week, and I've nearly been killed twice. So before I do anything else, 
you're going to have to tell me who you are and why it's so very important that you get my clothes off. The redhead took a deep breath and said slowly, as if she were speaking to a child, My name is Genya. In less than an hour, you will be presented to the king, and it is my job to make sure you look presentable. My anger evaporated. I was going to meet the king? Oh, I said meekly. Yes, oh, so shall we? I nodded mutely, and Genya clapped her hands. The servants flew into action, yanking out my clothes and dragging me into the bathroom. Last night, I'd been too tired to notice the room, but now, even shivering and scared witless at the prospect of having to, having to meet a king, I marveled at the tiny bronze tiles that rippled over every surface and the sunken oval tub of beaten copper that the servants were filling into steaming water. Beside the tub, the, walls, the wall was covered in a mosaic of shells and shimmering abalon. In, in, said one of the servants, giving me a nudge. I climbed in. The water was painfully hot, but I endured it rather than try to ease in slowly. Military life had long ago cured me of most of my modesty, but there was something very different about being the only naked person in the room especially when everyone kept shooting curious glances at me. I squeaked, I squeaked as one of the servants grabbed my head and began furiously washing my hair. Another leaned over the tub and started scrubbing at my nails. Once I adjusted, adjusted to it, the heat of the water felt good on my aching body. I hadn't had a hot bath in well over a year, and I had never even dreamed that the there might be such a tub. Clearly, being Grisha had its benefits. I could have spent an hour just paddling around, but once I had been thoroughly dunked and scrubbed, a servant yanked, at, yanked my arm and ordered, Out, out. Reluctantly, I climbed from the tub, letting the women dry me roughly with thick towels. One of the younger servants stepped forward with a heavy velvet robe, and led me into the bedroom. Then she and the others backed out the door, leaving me alone with Genya. I watched the redhead war warily. She had thrown open the curtains and pulled an elaborate carved wooden table and chair over by the windows. Sir, oh, sit, she commanded. I bridled at her tone, but I obeyed. A small trunk lay open by her hand, its contents spread out onto the tabletop. Squat glass jars full of what looked like berries, leaves, and colored powders. I didn't have a chance to investigate further, because Genya took hold of my chin, peering closely at my face and turning my bruised cheek toward the light from the window. She took a breath and let her fingers travel over my skin. I felt the same prickling sensation I'd experienced when the healer took care of my wounds from the fold. Long minutes passed as I clenched my hands into fists to keep from scratching. Then Ginya stepped back and the itching receded. She handed me a small golden hand mirror. The bruise was completely gone. I pressed the skin tentatively, tentatively, but there was no soreness. Thank you, I said, setting the mirror down and starting to stand, but Genya pushed me right back down into the chair. Where do you think you're going? We're not done, but if the Darkling just wanted you healed, he would have sent a healer. You're not a healer? I'm not wearing red, am I? Genya retorted, an edge of bitterness to her voice. She gestured to herself. I'm a tailor. I was baffled. I realized I'd never seen a Grisha in a white kefta. You're going to make me a dress? Ginya blew out an exasperated breath. Not the robes. This, she said, waving her long, graceful fingers before her face. You don't think I was born looking like this, do you? I stared at the smooth marble perfection of Ginya's features as realization set in and, with it, a wave of indignation. You want to change my face? Not change it, just 
freshen you up a bit. I scowled. I knew what I looked like. In fact, I was actually aware of my shortcomings, but I really didn't need a gorgeous Grisha pointing them out to me. And worse was the fact that the Darkling had sent her to do it. Forget it, I said, jumping to my feet. If the Darkling doesn't like the way I look, that's his problem. Do you like the way you look? Ginya asked with what seemed to, to be genuine curiosity. Not particularly, I snapped. But my life has gotten confusing enough without seeing a stranger's face in the mirror. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way, Genya said. I can't make big changes, just small ones. Even out, even out your skin. Do something with that mousy hair of yours. I've perfected myself, but I've had my whole life to do it. I wanted to argue, but she actually was perfect. Get out. Ginya cocked her head to one side, stunning me. Why are you taking this so personally? Wouldn't you? I have no idea. I've always been beautiful. And humble, too? She shrugged. So I'm beautiful. That doesn't mean am much am among Grisha. The Darkling doesn't care what you look like, just what you can do. Then why did he send you? Because the king loves beauty, and the Darkling knows that. In the king's court, appearances are everything. If, you, if you're to be the salvation of all, of all of Ravka, well, it would be better if you looked to the part. I crossed my arms and looked out the window. Outside, the sun was shining off a small lake, a tiny island at its center. I had no idea what time it was or how long I'd slept. Genya walked over to me. You're not ugly, you know. Thanks, I said dryly, still staring out at the wooded grounds. You just look a little tired, sickly, skinny. Well, Genya said reasonably, you said it yourself. You've been traveling hard for days, and I sighed. This is how I always look. I rested my head on the cool glass, feeling the anger and embarrassment drain out of me. What was I fighting for? If I was honest with myself, the prospect of what Ginya was offering was tempting. Fine, I said. Do it. Thank you, exclaimed Ginya, clapping her hands together. I looked at her sharply, but there was no sarcasm in her voice or ex or expression. She's relieved, I realized. The Darkling had set Ginya to a task, and I wondered what might have happened if, to her if I'd refused. I let her lead me back to the chair. Just don't get carried away, I said. Don't worry, said the redhead. You'll still look like yourself, just like you've had more than a few hours of sleep. I'm very good. I can see that, I said. I closed my eyes. It's okay, she said. You can watch. She handed me the gold mirror, but no more talk, and stay still. I held up the mirror and watched as Genya's cool fingers, fingertips descended slowly over my forehead. My skin prickled, and I watched with growing amazement as Genya's hands traveled over my skin. Every blemish, every scrape, every flaw seemed to disappear beneath her fingers. She placed her thumbs my her thumbs beneath my eyes. Oh, I exclaimed in surprise as the dark circles that had plagued me ever since childhood disappeared. Don't get too excited, Ginya said. It's temporary. She reached for one of the roses on the table and plucked a pale pink petal and she held it up to my cheek and the color bled from the petal onto my skin, leaving that what looked like a pretty what pretty flush then she held a fresh petal to my lips and repeated the process it only lasts a few days she informed me now the hair she plucked a long comb made of bone from her trunk along with a glass jar full of something shiny stunned i asked is that a real is that real gold of course ginya said Lifting a chunk of my dull brown hair, she shook some of the gold leaf, gold leaf onto the crown of my head and 
As she pulled the comb through my hair, the gold seemed to dissolve into shimmering strands. As Ginya finished with each section, she wound it around her fingers, letting the hair fall in waves. Finally, she stepped back, wearing a smug smile. Better know? I examined myself in the mirror. My hair shone. My cheeks held a rosy fl flush. I still wasn't pretty, but I couldn't deny the improvement. I wondered what Maul would think if he was me, then shoved the, t the thought away. Better, I agreed grudgingly. Genya gave a plaintive sigh. It's really the best I can do for now. Thanks, I said tartly. But then Genya winked at me and smiled. Besides, she, she said, you don't want to attract too much attention from the king. Her voice was light, but I saw a shadow pass over her features as she strode across the room and opened the door to let the servants rush back in. They pushed me behind an ebony screen inlaid with mother of pearl stars so that it resembled a night sky. In a few moments, I was dressed in a clean tunic and trousers, soft leather boots, and a gray coat. With disappointment, I realized it was just a clean version of my army uniform. There was even a little cartographer's patch showing a compass rose, a compass, showing a compass rose on the right sleeve. My feelings must have shown on my face. Not what you expected? Ginya asked with some amusement. I just thought, but what I, but what had I thought? Did I really think I belonged in Grisha robes? The king ex expects to see a humble girl plucked from the ranks of his army, an undiscovered treasure. If you appear in a kefta, he'll think the Darkling's been hiding you. Why would the Darkling hide the Darkling hide me? Genya shrugged. For leverage? For profit? Who knows? But the king is well, you'll see what the king is. My stomach turned. I was about to be presented to the king. I tried to steady myself, but as Genya hurried me out the door and down the hall, my legs felt leaden and shaky. Near the bottom of the stairs, she whispered, if, anything, if anyone asks, I just helped you get dressed. I'm not supposed to work on Grisha. Why not? Because the ridiculous queen and her more ridiculous court think it's not fair. I gaped at her. Insulting the queen could be considered treason, but Genya seemed unconcerned. When we entered the huge domed hall, it was crowded with Grisha in robes of crimson, purple, and darkest blue. Most of them looked to be around my age, but a few older Grisha were gathered in a corner. Despite the silver in their hair and their lined faces, they were strikingly attractive. In fact, anyone in the room was unnervingly good-looking. The queen may have a point, I murmured. Oh, this isn't my handiwork, said Genya. I frowned. If Genya was telling the truth, then this was just further evidence that I didn't belong here. Someone had seen us enter the hall, and a hush fell as every eye in the room fastened onto me. A tall, broad-chested Grisha in red robes came forward. He had deeply tanned skin and seemed to exude, exude good health. He made a low bow and said, I am Sergei Veznikov. I'm... I know who you are, of course, Sergei interrupted, his white teeth flashing. Come, let me introduce you. You'll be walked... You'll be walking with us. He took me by the elbow and began to steer me toward a group of corporalki. She's a sum she's a summoner, Sergei, said a girl in a blue kefta with flowing brown curls. She walks with us. There were murmurs of assent from the other Ethralki behind her. Marie, said Sergei with the inse insincere smile. You can't possibly be suggesting that she enter the hall as a lower lower order Grisha. Marie's alabaster skin went suddenly blotchy, and several of her summon of the summoners got to their feet. 
Need I remind you that the Darkling is himself a summoner? So you're ranking yourself with the Darkling now? Marie sputtered, and in an attempt to make peace, I interjected, Why don't I just go with Genya? There were a few low snickers. With the tailor? Sergei asked, looking aghast. I glanced at G Genya, who simply smiled and shook her head. She belongs with us, protested Marie. An argument broke out all over around all broke out all around us. She'll walk with me, said a low voice, and the room went silent. Mm. That was chapter six. Chapter seven. I turned and saw the Darkling standing in an archway, flanked by Ivan and several other Grisha, whom I recognized from the journey. Marie and Sergei backed away hastily. The Darkling surveyed the crowd and said, We are expected. Instantly, the room bustled with activity as the Grisha rose and began to file through the large double doors that led outside. They arranged themselves two abreast in a long line, first the material key, then the earthroll key, and finally the corporal key, so that the highest ranked Grisha would enter the throne room last. Unsure of what to do, I stayed where I was, watching the crowd. I looked around for Genya, but she seemed to have disappeared. A moment later, the Darkling beside me, the Darkling beside me. I glanced up at his pale profile, the sharp jaw, the granite eyes. You look all rest, well rested, he said. I bristled. I wasn't comfortable with what Genya had done, but standing in a room full of beautiful Grisha, I had to admit that I was grateful for it. I still didn't look like I belonged, but I would have stuck out much worse without Genya's help. Are there other tailors? I asked. Genya is unique, he answered, he answered, glancing at me, like us. I ignored the little thrill that went through me at the word us and said, why isn't she walking with the rest of us, rest of the Grisha? Genya must attend to the queen. Why? When Ginya's abilities began to show themselves, I could have had her choose between becoming a fabricator or corporal Instead, I cultivated her particular, particular aff affinity and made a gift of her to the queen. A gift? So Grisha is no better than a serf? We all serve someone, he said, and I was surprised by the harsh edge in his voice. Then he added, the king will expect a demonstration. I felt as if I'd been debunked in ice water. I've been dunked in ice water. But I don't know how to. I don't expect you to, he said calmly, moving forward as the last of, of the red-robed corporal key disappeared through the door. We emerged onto the gravel path and into the last of the afternoon sunshine. I was finding it hard to breathe. I felt as if I were walking to my execution. Maybe I am, I thought, with a surge of dread. This isn't fair, I whispered angrily. I don't know what the king thinks I can do, but it isn't fair to throw me out there, out there and expect me just to just make things happen. I hope you don't expect fairness from me, Alina. It isn't one of my specialties. I stared at him. What was I, what was I supposed to make out of that? The Darkling glanced down at me. Do you really believe I brought you all this way to make a fool out of you? Out of both of us? No, I admitted. And it's completely out of your hands now, isn't it? He said, he said as we made our way through the dark wooded tunnel of branches. That was true too, if not particularly comfort, comforting. I had no choice but to trust that he knew what he was doing. I had a sudden unpleasant thought. Are you going to cut me again? I asked. I doubt I'll have, I'll have to, but it all depends on you. I was not reassured. I tried to calm myself and to slow the beating of my heart, but before I knew it, we had made our way through the grounds and were climbing the white marble steps to the Grand Palace. 
as we moved through a spacious entry hall into a long corridor lined with mirrors and ornamented in gold. I thought how different this place was from the little palace. Everywhere I looked, I saw marble and gold, soaring walls of white and pale, palest blue, gleaming chandeliers, levied of footmen, polished parquet floors laid out in elaborate geometric designs. It wasn't without beauty, but there was something exhausting about the extravagance of it all. I'd always assumed that Ravka's hungry peasants and poorly supplied soldiers were the result of the shadow fold. But as we walked by a tree of jade embellished with diamond leaves, I wasn't so sure. The throne room was three stories high, every window sparkling with gold, gold double eagles. A long, pale blue carpet ran the length of the room to where the members of the court milled about a raised throne. Many of the men wore military dress, black trousers, and white coats laden with medals and ribbons. The women sparkled in gowns of liquid, liquid silk, with little puffed sleeves and low necklines flanking the carpeted aisle. The Grisha stood arranged in their separate orders. A hush fell as every face turned to me and the darkling. As we walked slowly toward the golden throne, as we drew closer, the king sat, sat up straighter, tense with excitement. He looked to be in his forties, slender and round-shouldered, with big watery eyes and a pale mustache. He wore full military dress, a thin sword at his side, his narrow chest covered with medals. Beside him on the raised dais stood a man with a long dark beard. He wore priest priest robes, but a gold double eagle was emblazoned on his chest. The darkling gave me gave my arm a gentle squeeze to warn me that we were stopping. Your Highness, Moitzar, he said in clear tones, Alina Starkov, the Sun Summoner. He rush a rush of murmurs came from the crowd. I wasn't sure if I should bow or curtsy. Anna Kuya had insisted that all the orphans know how to greet the Duke's few noble guests, but somehow it didn't feel right to curtsy in army issue trousers. The king saved me from making a blunder when he waved us forward impatiently. Come, come, bring her to me. The Darkling and I walked to the base of the dais. The king scrutinized, scrutinized me. He frowned and his lower lip jutted out slightly. She's very plain. I flushed and bit my tongue. The king wasn't much to look at either. He was practically chinless, and close up, I could see the broken blood vessels in his nose. Show me, the king commanded. My stomach clenched. I looked at the darkling. This was it. He, he nodded at me and spread his arms wide. A tense silence descended at his hands, as his hands filled with dark swirling ribbons of blackness that bled into the air. He brought his hands together with a, round, with a resounding crack. Nervous cries burst from the crowd as darkness blanketed the room. This time, I was better prepared for the dark that engulfed me. But I was still frightening. But it was still frightening. Instinctively, I reached forward, searching for something to hold on to. The Darkling caught my arm and his bare hand slid into mine. I felt that same powerful certainty wash through me. And then the Darkling's call, pure and compelling, demanding an answer, with a mixture of panic and relief. I felt something rising up inside me. This time, I didn't try to fight it. I let it have its way. Light flooded the throne room, drenching us in warmth and shattering the darkness like black glass. The court erupted into applause. Some people were weeping and hugging one another. A woman fainted. The king was clapping the loudest, the loudest, rising from his throne and applauding furiously, his expression exultant. The darkling let go of my hand and the light faded. Brilliant, the king shouted. A miracle! He descended the steps of the dais, the bearded priest gliding silently behind him. 
and took my hand in his own, raising it to his wet lips. My dear girl, he said, my dear, dear girl. I thought of the way of what Genya had said about the king's attention and felt my skin crawl, but I didn't dare pull my hand away. Soon, though, he had relinquished me and was clapping the darkling on the back. Miraculous, simply miraculous, he effused. Come, we must make plans immediately. As the king and the darkling stepped away to talk, she, the priest drifted forward. A miracle indeed, he said, staring at me with disturbing intensity. His eyes were so brown they were almost black, and he smelled faintly of mildew and incense, like a lamb, like, like a tomb, I thought with a shiver. I was grateful that when he slithered away to join the king. I was quickly surrounded by beautifully dressed men and women, all wishing to make my acquaintance and to touch my hand or my sleeve. They crowded on every side of me, jostling and pushing to get closer, just as I felt fresh panic sitting in. Genya appeared by my side, but my relief, but my relief was short-lived. The queen wants to meet you, she murmured into my ear. She steered me through the crowd and out a narrow side door into the hall, and th then into a jewel-like sitting room where the queen reclined on a divan, a snuffling, a snuffling dog with a pushed-in face crawled, cradled on her lap. The queen was beautiful, with glossy blonde hair in a perfect quiffer, her delicate features cold and lovely. But there was also something a little odd about her face. Her irises seemed a little too blue, her hair too yellow, her skin too smooth. I wondered just how much work Genya had done on her. She was surrounded by ladies in exquisite gowns of petal, petal pink and soft blue. Their low necklines, embroidered with gilded thread and tiny river, river pearls, and yet they all paled beside Genya in her simple cream wool kefta, her bright red hair burning like a flame. Moya Turis Sarita Sarita Moya Sarita Genya said, sinking into a low, graceful curtsy. The Sun Summoner. This time, I had to make a choice. I executed a small bow and heard a few low titters from the ladies. Charming, said the queen. I loathe pretense. It took all my willpower not to snort at this. You are from a Grisha family? she asked. I glanced nervously at Genya, who nodded encouragement. No, I said, and then quickly added, Moya Tsaritsa. A peasant, then? I nodded. We are so lucky in our people, the queen said, and the ladies murmured soft assent. Your family must be so notified of your new st status. Genya had, will send a messenger. Genya nodded and gave another little curtsy. I thought about just nodding right along with her, but I wasn't sure I wanted to start lying to royalty. Actually, your highness, I was raised in Duke Kram Kramzov's household. The ladies buzzed and surprised, and even Genya looked curious. An orphan? Ex exclaimed the queen, sounding delighted. How marvelous! I wasn't sure that I would describe my parents being dead as marvelous, but at a loss for anything else to say, I mumbled, Thank you, Moy Zaritza. This all must seem so very strange to you. Take care, take care that life at at court does not corrupt you the way it has others, she said, her blue marble eyes sliding to Genya. The insult was unmistakable, but Genya's expression betrayed nothing, a fact that which did not seem to please the queen. She dismissed us with a flick of her ring-laden fingers. Go now. As Genya led me back into the hallway, I thought I heard her mutter, old cow, 
But before I could decide whether or not to ask her about what the queen had said, a darkling was there, steering, steering us down an empty corridor. How did you fare with the queen? He asked. I have no idea, I said honestly. Everything she said was perfectly nice, but the whole time she was looking at me as if I were something her dog spit up. Ginya laughed, and the darkling's lips quirked in what was nearly a smile. Welcome to court, he said. I'm not sure I like it. No one does, he admitted, but we all make a good show of it. The king seemed pleased, I offered. The king is a child. My mouth fell open in shock, and I looked around nervously, afraid someone had overheard. These people seemed to speak treason as easily as breathing. Genya didn't look remotely disturbed by the Darkling's words. The Darkling must have noticed my discomfort, because he said, But today, you've made a very happy child. You've made him a very happy child. Who was that bearded man with the king? I asked, eager to change the subject. The apparat. Is he a priest? Of a sort. Some say he's a fanatic. Others say he's a fraud. And you? I say he has his uses. The darkling turned to Genya. I think we've asked enough of Alina for today, he said. Take her back to her chambers and have her fitted for her kefta. She will start in instruction tomorrow. Ginya gave a little bow and laid her hand on my arm to lead me away. I was overcome by excitement and relief. My power, my, my power, it still doesn't seem real, had shown up again and kept me from making a fool of myself. I'd made it through my introduction to the king and my aud audience with the queen, and I was going to be given a gracious kefta, Ginya, the Darkling called after us. The Kefta will be black. Ginya drew a startled breath. I looked at her stunned, fa stunned face, and then at the Darkling, who was already turning, turning to go. Wait, I called before I could stop myself. The Darkling halted and turned those slate-colored eyes on me. I, if it would be all right, I'd prefer to have blue robes. Summoner's blue. Alina, exclaimed Ginya, clearly horrified. But the Darkling held up a hand in, to silence her. Why? he asked, his expression unreadable. I already feel like I'm, I don't belong here. I think it might be easier if I weren't. Singled out. Are you so anxious to be like everyone else? My chin lifted. He clearly didn't approve, but I wasn't going to back down. I just don't want to be more conspicuous than I already am. The Darkling looked at me for a long moment. I wasn't sure if he was thinking, thinking over what I'd said or trying to intimidate me, but I gritted my teeth and returned his gaze. Abruptly, he nodded. As you wish, he said, your kefta will be blue. And without another word, he turned his back on us and disappeared down the hall. Genya stared at me. Aghast. What? I asked. What? I asked defensively. Alina, Genya said slowly. No other Grisha has ever been permitted to wear a Darkling's colors. Do you think he's angry? That's hardly the point. It would have been a mark of your, stand of your standing, of the Darkling's esteem. It would have placed you high above all others. Well, I don't want to be high above all others. Genya grew, threw up her hands in an exasperation and took me uh, by the elbow, leading me back through the palace to the main entrance. Two liveried servants opened the large golden doors for us. With a jolt, I realized that they were wearing white and gold, the same colors as Genya's kefta, a servant's colors. No wonder she thought I was crazy for refusing the Darkling's offer. And maybe she was right. The thought stayed with me through the long walk back across the grounds to the little palace. Dusk was falling, and the servants were lighting the lamps that lined the gravel path. By the time we climbed the stairs to my room, my stomach was in knots. I sat down by the window, staring out at the grounds while I brooded. 
Genya rang for a servant, whom she sent to find a seamstress and order up a dinner tray. But before she sent the girl away, she turned to me. Maybe you'd prefer to wait and dine with Agrisha later tonight? She asked. I shook my head. I was far too tired and overwhelmed to even think about being around another crowd of people. But, we'll, but would you stay? I asked her. She hesitated. You don't have to, of course, I said quickly. I'm sure you'll want to eat with everyone else. Not at all. Dinner for two, then, she said imperiously, and the servant raced off. Ginya closed the door and walked to the little dressing table, where she started straightening the items on its surface. A comb, a brush, a pen, and a pot of ink. I didn't recognize any of them, but someone must have had them brought to my room for me. With her back still to me, Genya said, Alina, you should understand that when you start training tomorrow, well, well, corp corporal key don't eat with summoners. Summoners don't dine with fripicators, and I felt instantly defensive. Look, if you don't want to stay for dinner, I promise not to cry t into any soup, into my soup. No, she exclaimed. It's not that at all. I'm just trying to explain the way things work. Forget it. Ginya blew out of out a frustrated breath. You don't understand. It's a great honor to be asked to dine with you, but the other Grisha might not might not approve. Why? Ginya sighed and sat down on one of the carved chairs. Because I'm the queen's pet. Because they don't consider what I what I do valuable. A lot of reasons. I considered what the other reasons might be. And if they had something to do with the king. I thought of the liveried servant. Liv the liv liv liveried servants standing at every doorway in the grand palace. All of them dressed in white and gold. What must it be like for Genya? Isolated from her own kind, but not a true member of the court. It's funny, I said after a while. I always thought being beautiful would make life so much easier. Oh, it does, Genya said, and laughed. I couldn't help but laugh, too. We were interrupted by a knock on the door, and st stream, and the stream, the seamstress soon had us occupied with fittings and measurements. When she had finished and was gathering up her muslin and pin and pins, Genya whispered, It isn't too late, you know. You could still... But I cut her off. Blue. I said firmly, though my stomach clenched again. The seamstress left, and we turned our attention to dinner. The food was less alien than I'd expected. The kind of food we'd eaten on feast days at Karamzin. Sweet pea porri porridge, quail roasted in honey, and fresh figs. I found I was hungrier than I'd ever be been and had to resist picking up my plate to, to lick it. Genya maintained a steady stream of cheddar during dinner, mostly about Grisha gossip. I didn't know any of the people she was talking about, but I was grateful not to have to make a conversation. So I nodded and smiled when necessary. When the last serv when the last servants left, taking our dinner dishes with them, I couldn't suppress a yawn. And Ginya rose. I'll come get you for breakfast in the morning. It will take a while for you to learn your way around. The little palace can be a bit of a maze. Then her perfect lips turned up in a mischievous smile. You should try to rest. Tomorrow you meet Bagra. Bagra? Ginya grinned, grinned quickly, wickedly. Oh yes, she's an absolute treat. Before I could ask what she meant, she gave me a little wave and slipped out the door. I bit my lip. Exactly what was in store for me tomorrow? As the door closed behind Ginya, I felt fatigue creep over me. The thrill of knowing, the thrill of knowing that my power might actually be real. The excitement of meeting the king and queen, the strange marvels of the grand palace, 
and the little palace had kept, kept my exhaustion at bay. But now it returned, and with it a huge echoing feeling of loneliness. I undressed, hung my uniform neatly on a peg behind the star-speckled screen, and placed my shiny new boots beneath it. I rubbed the, br the brushed wool of the coat between my fingers, hoping to find some sense of familiarity. But the fabric felt wrong, too stiff, too new. I, sud I suddenly missed my dirty old coat. I changed into a night dress of soft white cotton and rinsed my face as I petted it, as I petted it dry. I caught a glimpse of myself in the glass above the basin. Maybe it was the lamplight, but I thought I looked even better when Genya had first finished her work on me. After a moment, I realized I was just gawking at myself in the mirror and had to smile. For a girl who hated looking at herself, I was at risk of becoming vain. I climbed onto the high bed, slid beneath the heavy silks and furs, and blew out the lamp. Distantly, I heard a door closing, voices calling their good nights, the sounds of the little palace going to sleep. I stared into the darkness. I'd never have, I'd never had a room to myself before. In Karamzin, I'd slept in an old portrait hall that had been converted into a dorm dormitory, surrounded by countless other girls. In the army, I'd slept in the barracks or tents with the other surveyors. My new room felt huge and empty. In the silence, all the, the events of the day rushed in on me, and tears pricked my eyes. Maybe I would wake, wake tomorrow and find that it had all been a dream, that Alexei was still alive and Maul was unhurt, that no one had tried to kill me, that I'd never met the king and queen or seen the apparat, or felt the darkling's hand on the nape of, of my neck. Maybe I would wake to smell the campfires burning, safe in my own clothes, on my little cot, and I could tell Maul all about the, stra the strange and terrifying, but very beautiful dream. I rubbed my thumb over the scar in my palm and heard Maul's voice saying, we'll be okay, Alina, we always are. I hope so, Maul. I whispered into my pillow and let my tears carry me to sleep. And that was the end of chapter seven. I hope you all enjoyed that. I hope you all enjoyed that chapter in that last chapter. It's, I'm hoping this is gonna be close to the uh, series once I finish this, uh, this book. And I hope to see you all in the next video.